Welcome back to Information Technology Fundamentals. In this video, we're going to review secure web browsing. So we're going to explain the risks of using open internet access. Uh, we're just going to describe safe browsing practices and how to configure our browser security and privacy features and identify the use and basic configurations of a firewall. So let's begin by discussing uh, open access points that allow uh, people to connect to, to the internet from various public locations, such as um, businesses, organizations, maybe even government places. So what we need to keep in mind is that uh, any data that we send to these open uh, networks over the Wi-Fi is not going to be encrypted or secured. So that means anybody can capture and look at the data. If you are uh, connecting to your email or your banking or any of that information through a web browser, you have to make sure that you're using an HTTPS connection up in the top of the browser. That way when you transmit your password and other information, it is encrypted at that point. If you go to a website that is not, that's just using HTTP, everything you send back and forth could be collected by someone else. Beyond using your device on an open network, we also have many places where you can find a public access workstation with internet. So a library, uh, there's internet cafes, if you go to a hotel, they have business centers. But you have to be aware that any of these workstations uh, could have infected malware on them. You don't know who used the computer just before you. Uh, they could have somehow installed a keylogger or other types of vicious malware, in which case they could be capturing what you're doing. So uh, one of the things you can do is when you're finished with the session is to clear all the history and browser cache. But really, you shouldn't uh, on a public access workstation uh, do anything uh, or perform anything like banking or anything like that because uh, you just don't know who, who might capture that information. There are many types of malware. Well, we've given them some categories. We have viruses and worms, Trojan horse, adware, spyware. A virus is malware that's principally designed to spread to other PCs. A Trojan horse is a something that looks legitimate, uh, like a legitimate application that conceals uh, malicious software with it. Adware is software uh, that's installed on your uh, computer that tracks where you're going and displays ads to you. Spyware is similar to adware, only instead of serving you up ads, it's collecting the information and sending it back to somebody else. Uh, some of the ways you can combat that is to make sure you use up-to-date browsers and that you install security patches on those when they're released. On the left side on the slide here, we have a uh, rat management console, so a remote access uh, terminal. And this is used f by bad actors when they put spyware and adware on a computer, and this is how they control it remotely. So how do you know if you have spyware or adware on your computer? The point of these uh, spyware and adware and other malware is not to be detected. So it's not going to send uh, some big notice to you that you're going to notice. You have to notice things like uh, pop-up windows happening, uh, new browser toolbars, somehow uh, your search provider uh, change. You went to go to a website and it had an unexpected redirection. You went somewhere you didn't intend to. You get ads that show uh, that uh, try to look like a antivirus software telling you you have thousands of viruses on your computer. These are symptoms of spyware and adware. So as you're uh, setting up your computer, you're going to use a browser and most people might end up using multiple browsers. So with Windows, you get uh, their browser that's built in, which is called Edge. Uh, many people use Chrome. We also uh, uh, have Firefox. And on Apple, we have Safari. So those are the big supported ones. Um, at this point, 
in 2020, we should not be using Internet Explorer to do anything on the web. It's old technology. It has many vulnerabilities. So if you have that on your computer, uh, you shouldn't be using it for anything. Uh, but beyond those, if you went a little bit further, you'll see there's a whole bunch of other browsers that uh, claim to be secure and have some other things uh, associated with them. There's Brave and Opera and uh, several more. So do a little research to pick out the browser that is best for you. When you go to a website, there is something on them that's called Active uh, Content, which is scripting, uh, Java is another language that's used, and we have two old ones here listed, Flash and Silverlight, uh, which you should not be using. Unfortunately, there's still companies that are putting content on their website with Flash and Silverlight, both of which have many vulnerabilities. Uh, but scripting is just the... Uh, uh, programming that gives interactivity on a website. So when you click on a button on YouTube and it plays the video and you push it again and it pauses, you're interacting with it. That functionality is caused by scripting. Most of the time, the scripting is written in JavaScript, but it could be written in other languages as well. So when we talk about scripting, it's going to happen in one of two places. It's going to happen on your computer locally, which is called client-side scripting. Uh, when that happens, it's using your processors, processor and your resources to perform whatever function the script is calling for. And there is server-side scripting, where the scripting happens on the server that you're connecting to. When you have interactions, particularly with databases, the act of querying or looking something up is happening not on your computer locally, but on the server. Uh, one of the things you can do, uh, sir, uh, scripting can be dangerous, it can eat up your resources, and it can be a sign of malware. Some companies turn scripting off on the client side and don't allow any client side scripting. Many browsers support that, but not all of them do. The other uh, way that malware can get on your computer is through something called add-ons. And these are, we call them extensions, plugins, sometimes you look at them as themes, but they give our browser additional abilities to do things. So for example, Adobe um, Acrobat has an add-in for the browser that allows you to convert a web page into a PDF document that you can then sign, uh, save and look at later offline. Uh, but you need to know where to go and look at your add-ins and review what's there and make sure that there's none, no add-ons you're unsure about. If you see an add-on that you have no idea what it is, look it up uh, using your favorite search engine. And if it looks like it's malware, make sure you uninstall it right away. So what is a cookie in the computer world? You might have heard this term a lot of times. So a cookie is a plain text file created by a website when you visit it. It stores it on your computer and it, um, it can have a lot of different information stored in it. But the classic way to look at it is I went browsing for boots on Amazon and then I went to another website and suddenly it's serving me up 4,000 ads about different types of boots. That's because when you browsed or searched for boots on Amazon, it placed a cookie on your machine that said you did that. The next website you went to read that cookie and tried to serve up information to you that's relevant in hopes that you will buy some boots. So all the, all on the surface, this seems like it could be uh, annoying. It can also be dangerous because that cookie is capturing some other information, in particular uh, your IP address and some other things will identify where in the world you are. Um, they may also st store other personally identify information that you're unaware of. So you have to be... Uh, concerned about your cookies and know what the websites say they are placing on your your computer. Now the good news is we can clear these cookies at any time. Uh, so all web browsers have the ability to do that and most web browsers give you the, the ability that each time you close the browser it clears your cookies and your history. Now it is possible uh, many of these cookies also store your username. So if you've ever seen a website where you checkmark remember me, 
So the next time you come back, it automatically fills in your username. That is stored in a cookie. And all the other websites that you visit can read that cookie. So again, we need to be concerned about it. If uh, the website developers are doing their job properly, they shouldn't be capturing anything that could uh, be considered per PII, but not all um, web developers <laughs> do that correctly. So a pop-up window is uh, uh, still around. In fact, the person who invented pop-up windows was a German, and once when they asked him about it, he said he regretted making or coming up with the idea. And that's because pop-up windows are annoying. You're at the website and a window pops up and says, hey, fill out this form, tell us how we're doing. Um, these things can be generated by a script or by clicking a link. They frequently are used for malware infections. They tell you, for example, your antivirus has detected 4,000 things. Click here to remove them. And when you click on it, it sends you to a malicious website. So pop-up windows happen. We would like to see most of our legitimate websites not use them. And most browsers have a setting to turn off or deny pop-up windows. So as I mentioned before, we can control cookies and pop-ups in the browser settings. And each browser is going to look a little bit different from or, or where the settings are and what they're called. Sometimes it's under privacy, sometimes it's under security. So you might have to do a, a little bit of Google search to locate the settings for the particular browser you are using. Most browsers today also fit, uh, use autofill, which means when I fill out a form, it remembers my name and my address, my zip code, and all that stuff. So the next time I go to fill out another form, it auto-fills for me so I don't have to fill all that in. Certainly that is convenient, but of course anything that is stored in the auto-fill in my browser can be read by anything, and a lot of that might be personally identifiable information. Now, you can manually go in, again, into the settings and turn that off, along with uh, the other thing is the browser cache. So each time I go to a website, a copy of that browser or that website is actually stored on my computer in its history locally. And of course, other when I browse to another website, it can read what's in there too. So we can uh, manually clear the browser cache and we can turn off the autofill. If we use the private or incognito mode, it turns off this uh, storage for both of these. Um, but don't think of private or incognito as, um, as a secure way to browse in that nobody can see what you're doing or anything like that. Really all it's saying is it's not storing any information from the websites you visit. A digital certificate is very important when we visit websites. So if I go to my, my bank website, I'm going to see up in the address bar a little green, uh, it looks, the icon can look different in different browsers, but when I click in it, click on it, it's gonna tell me about the digital certificate for the website. So a digital certificate is issued by a third party and banks and other companies pay for this service. And that third party will guarantee the identity of the um, company that has the website. So you have a third party guaranteeing the authority. And in that certificate, there is something called a public key that allows for the start of an encrypted session between two computers. So, this is really important. If you're doing any type of financial work or anything like that, you should only be doing it on a website that has a digital certificate. And here is an example. Down here we have Bank of America Corp and you see the little lock. And because it's green, that means it's a certificate. And when we click on that, here is the identification about it. It's uh, the issuer, the name of it, who it is. And now we're sure we're at the correct website. Nobody is trying to fool us about what's there. 
If we go to a site with a certificate that's invalid, expired, or for whatever reason, the browser determines it's uh, not a valid, browsers today will give you a message as you see here. So if you see this uh, problem with the security certificate, you the best idea is not to proceed. Maybe if it's your bank, maybe you want to call them on the phone to do your business, but it would be a bad idea at this point to do any type of interaction with that website if there's a problem with their security certificate. So a firewall is a, could be software or hardware. In Windows 10, it's built in as software. Most all the uh, Soho gateway routers and the ones from your ISP have a firewall in them as well. And what they do is they monitor the traffic that's coming in and out of your network by the TCP and UDP port number. They analyze what is coming in and out. And what they're trying to do is just make sure legitimate traffic is the only thing that traverses that firewall. Uh, so we could have a network firewall, so that would be on your gateway or modem from your ISP, and you can have one on the host, so on your personal computer, and all Windows 10, Mac, and most Linux computers have that built into them as well. So in Windows, we're going to call it the Windows Defender Firewall. You can look that up through a couple of different ways, through the control panel, or through the security part of the settings. And in here you have many options. Uh, you can turn it on and off completely. Um, probably you don't want to turn it off unless you have a very specific reason. Or you can go in here and manually block some things as well. It's a place where you could actually uh, use the firewall to block a certain website if you didn't want anybody on your computer ever to go there. So you can find the Windows Defender Firewall uh, in the control panel. And if you turn off the firewall, you will get a notification from Windows in your notification area that tells you that it's off. So if you were doing something on your computer and suddenly you get a report that your firewall has been turned off, you might want to check to see what's going on because that would be one of the things malware would attempt to do on a computer is turn off your firewall. Now, a large enterprise network is going to use uh, something they call a, a border firewall, which is going to be its own individual appliance. And it's going to have a lot of other settings. And one of the things that might be part of this is going to be something called a proxy server. So the proxy server monitors all the traffic and captures all the internet traffic going back and forth. It can do a few other things. It can... Uh, uh, be a content server as well, but not to go too far into that. If your enterprise is using a proxy server along with a firewall, you may have to go into the settings of your um, browser or in your computer and tell it where the proxy server is that is going to monitor all the traffic back and forth. So we looked at the risks of having a uh, open internet access, we looked at some safe browsing practices and how to configure our browser, and we identified the use and basic configurations of a firewall.